Hello everybody and um, welcome to our virtual coffee morning, um, raising money for Macmillan Cancer Support. Um, two and a half million people in the UK today have a cancer diagnosis and more than a quarter of a million people are diagnosed with cancer every year in the UK. So it's an increasing problem but at least people are living longer after a diagnosis because we're catching it earlier catching that, sorry, and we're treating it better. But cancer diagnosis is still a huge shock for the individual, for their family, for their friends. And skillful and compassionate support is so important and this is where Macmillan comes in. They've been going for over 100 years, in 1911 I think Macmillan started it. And ask anyone who's been affected by cancer and who's used Macmillan and they are the go-to people at the time of great upset. And they produce information, they've got support groups, they've got volunteers, a specialist nursing. So they're here to support us when we need them. Now it's our turn to be here for them now. So in our webinar today, we've got nine fantastic speakers, great information about important subjects, about health, about wealth, and workplace issues around sickness. There are special offers and free information from all our speakers. Check in the emails and uh, uh, you'll get your links through to those. And we've got auctions as we go through the webinar with fabulous, fabulous gifts from our speakers. They've all been so generous, I'm so grateful. Um, so all the way through the webinar as well, you should see the Donate Now button up in the chat room. Everyone involved today is giving their time and all the money raised by the event is going straight to Macmillan. So don't be shy. Um, dig deep, give generously um, and help them keep delivering that grand support. Hope you brought some coffee with you. This is a virtual coffee morning. If you've got some cake too, that's lovely. In the chat room, share your response to our speakers, ask any questions, and share your story. Now, Annabelle's going to explain how the auctions work. Um, Annabelle, how do we bid in the auctions? Oh, I lost her. Never mind. We'll catch up with how the auctions I'm myself to uh, avoid mucking up your sound. Thank Each you. speaker has got an offer in the room, and I'm going to flash it up through pop-ins. Now, at the moment, I've got a pop-in up called Donate Now. Now, it should either have flashed across your screen, or if you can't see it, you will see it next to the chat room. There's the chat room, and there are polls, and there are pop-ins. So if you each offer has got a live link, so at the moment, if you were to click the Donate Now button, don't panic, it won't take any money out of your wallet, it will take you live to our donation page. So you might want to check that that works for you. When each speaker finishes, we will put up a link to the auction page where you can see all the offers we're auctioning in the room today. You can keep that open as a tab and go back to it without leaving the webinar. When you've chosen the ones you want to bid on, I want you to come back to the chat room and bid using the word that goes with the offer. So for example, Kerry's offer, the word will be Kerry. We're keeping it simple and I'll keep an eye on the chat room and feed back the state of the bidding. The winning bid will be asked to pay for the, th the thing they've won using the Donate Now button and we'll make sure you've got access to it and email us the receipt so we can connect you with how to claim your offer. And when we get further on, I'll make sure that the relevant email address is in the chat room so that the winners can get back to us with the receipt. I will be explaining it again later, but basically you get to choose what you bid on, you bid in the chat room, you pay for it by the donate link and you email us and we set you up with claiming what you've won. Brilliant. Uh, and but if people don't have their credit card with them, they can presumably pay later. They don't actually have to be sitting there tapping in their number into the, into the screen right now. No, but obviously it would be really nice if we weren't waiting more than 24 hours Absolutely. to close Got the it. sound. <laughs> Got it. Brilliant. So. Our first three speakers, and we've got a wonderful lineup today. Our first three speakers, first of all, it's going to be Rachel McGuinness. She's the zesty lady. And she's going to be talking about simple steps 
to a healthier, more energetic lifestyle. Then we've got Gail Morgan, who talking about creating a wardrobe that works. And then Alexander Merishu with information about reducing physical and mechanical stress on the body and the mind. So, Rachel. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you very much. Well, I, I love this zesty lady. It's really brilliant. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel runs Zest Lifestyle, which helps busy people sleep well, eat smart, move more, and chill out. I think I want four out of four of those, please, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> and you can have them. <laughs> uh, there we go. But I have to choose for myself. No time. Rachel, the founder of the Health Awareness Campaign, has been running this month, Zestember, um, trying to inspire us all to be healthier. And um, I hope it's working for me. <laughs> Rachel, um, I understand actually you used to be unhealthy. So what made you change that? Well, it all happened 15 years ago when I had a life-changing moment on a business trip to Barcelona and I woke up one morning after a, a client event and I felt horrible. There'd been, uh, I'd been drinking too much Rioja, eating too many tapas, smoking too many Ducada cigarettes and also there was a massive lack of sleep there as well. On my way to the bathroom, I caught myself in the hotel room mirror and I really didn't like what I saw and I decided in that moment that I really needed to change because the odds were stacking up against me. Uh, I was three years away from 40 and I'd yo-yo dieted for 22 years so that just goes to prove that yo-yo uh, that dieting doesn't work. My mother had a heart attack at the age of 65 and also was diagnosed with the leukemia and my father was on blood pressure tablets and had heart problems. His father had died of a heart attack in his mid-50s and my brother was on statin so I kind of thought I probably need to start doing something. So when I got back to the UK, I stopped dieting and started to eat healthily, stopped smoking, cut down on my drinking, uh, started to exercise, and it was amazing. Within six weeks, I felt and looked so much better, and I was also a lot more productive and focused at work. And within six months, I lost most of my weight, which is around 35 pounds in six months. Fantastic. So it, it's... It's lovely to see that it's actually it's not doing this weird thing about trying to starve yourself to death. It's just yeah, about definitely not. <laughs> being lean, living sensibly. So, what can you do to lower your risk of getting cancer, for example? Well, it, it's really following what I do. Keep as healthy as possible because you know we can't certain things we can't prevent, but it's lowering the risk. So follow my four pillars of vitality. So the first one is sleep well. Sleep is so important. People underestimate sleep. 30% of our biology happens when we're in deep sleep. Eat smart. Follow the 80-20 rule to maintain your weight, which is what I do. 80% of the time eat healthy. 20% of the time, you know, kind of do what you want, but listen to your body. Your body tells you a lot. Eat healthy proteins such as meat, fish, seafood, dairy, eggs, nuts. Uh, I prefer sheep and goat's milk cheese um, to cow's milk cheese, pulses and I say nuts and seeds and also don't forget your healthy fats and oils, lots of vegetables and salad and no more than three pieces of fruit a day. Also move more, you don't have to join a gym to keep fit but I'm a great fan of the 10 to 15 minute workouts doing high intensity interval training, that sounds scary but actually it's not too bad. Um, but you can go online and find lots of 10 to 15 minute workouts. Uh, you need to be doing the, the three S's which are uh, sweat, strength, stretch and also it's really important to chill out, uh, to take time out to relax and recharge because stress is not very good for the body at all. Really interesting, you mentioned only three bits of fruit I and mean, so stick on the veggie rather than the fruit side. Is that because of the sugar, the sugar yes. in the fruit? Yeah. Right, right. Um, so the Zestember, mm. September's been running. I've, I've plugged into this and it's been great. I've been getting these emails. It's fabulous. Um, so tell us where you started that. Um, well, it was because I, I was doing a report and I found out that our health, healthcare system is bursting at the seams with people with preventable lifestyle diseases. You know, things such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, liver disease, and also one in four cancers are preventable. They are caused by unhealthy lifestyles. So Zestember is all about inspiring the nation um, 
to get healthy through quick, simple and sensible daily tips called the 30 ways to get more zest. And people spread the zest on social media by doing healthy selfies and uh, or just sharing all the tips. Interesting, because we have a National Health Service, we have actually a na National Sickness Service actually, isn't it? Yes. And so this is a national health movement. Wonderful. Um, Rachel, um, just so thrilled. Rachel's got some wonderful auction um, items here. So she's giving a 60 minute consultation on Skype, that's £250 worth. And if you win the auction on uh, Rachel's um, Rachel auction, she'll help you get your life back on track, get the body, the mindset, the clarity, the mental strength that you're after. So bid Rachel in the chat room and you'll have an, uh, an hour on Skype with her and you'll get your energy levels right back up. So that's fantastic, Rachel. Thank you so much for being with us. Anything you're you welcome. want to finish with quickly? or you? Um, yes, if you want to get the 30 ways to get more zest, just go to Zestember. That's Z E S T E M B E R dot org dot UK. It's all completely free and uh, you can get Zesty. Fantastic. Uh, zesty Lady, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> ah, next up. Hello. Can I just remind people um, on the pop up on the offer in the chat room, if you click it, that doesn't commit you to paying any money, but it will allow you to bring up a tab where you can read Rachel's offer and the other offers. Um, after we've taken this little pop-up down. So if you can see the pop-up and you click on the bid now in the chat room, that will take you to everybody's offers and you can save them on a tab. So when we take them down, you can still carry on bidding in the chat room. Fantastic, really helpful, Annabelle, thanks. Next up, we've got Gail Morgan. And Gail helps women of a certain age. She said I was to use this phrase. I was a bit cautious about this one. <laughs> but women of a certain age who, who feel they've lost or misplaced their mojo, their style mojo, and who want to feel more confident in their clothes. Gail helps women of a certain age. Ah. She said I was to use this phrase. Gail's uh, process allows people to discover their own to style. Who feel they've lost or misplaced their mojo, their style mojo. And who want to feel more confident? I'm sorry, someone. Gail, I'm afraid you're processing because you're not on a headset. No, I'm on a headset. I think I think it was V coming into the program. Oh right, okay. So it's fine. Brilliant. Okay, we've signed V. Yeah. So Gail's process allows people to discover their own style, create a wardrobe that works for them and for their body their budget, for their lifestyle, um, and um, I was delighted here that um, Gail also works with men from time to time as well, because I think they, they all fall, in, fall into a suit and forget about it, it's, uh, we're missing stuff. Gail, this all sounds like great fun, so how did you first get involved in this world? I mean, style and image is an interesting area to be in, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's fascinating. And I absolutely, I'm still passionate about it after being involved for the last 20 odd years. Um, for, I found out about it. My mum had her colours done in the late 80s and I saw the difference it made to her. I had found out what the colours were that worked for me. And suddenly, when I wore clothes, I became visible. Whereas in the past, people hadn't really seen me before. They'd always ask me if I felt okay. And you know, you look a bit peaky. Are you all right? Which isn't great. Um, but once I found colours that worked for me and lifted me without doing anything else, I suddenly felt alive. As I say, people noticed me. My confidence increased. And you know, I just love being able to give that back to people, even you know now um, going forward. So it's brilliant. So why do you think people lose their way about this? Why why do women doubt themselves when it comes to their wardrobe? Um, I think because we have, as, certainly as women, we have so much choice. 
There are so many different types of clothes out there. So we are bombarded with information from the magazines, from the uh, clothes shops, from uh, TV. You know, what's one person saying? What's the other person saying? Should we be following fashion trends? And if we don't have a really good understanding of um, our colouring, but also our body shape as well, and also what works for our body shape, for our size, for our height, you know, if we don't know that, then going shopping just becomes a trauma for some people. And so although, you know, many women think, oh, shopping's a bit of a, uh, you know, a leisure pursuit, for other women it's just a nightmare because they get completely overwhelmed with what's available in the shops and end up just buying something because oh, it fits and it'll just do. Whereas, you know, I'm passionate about people loving their clothes. We should feel joy when we put our clothes on, not despair. Um, and really that's what it's all about, is empowering us to really love our clothes. Sounds great. Love the outside, so you can love the inside too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, when you're working with a client who's had cancer, what what are your priorities then, Gail? Um, well, it, obviously, it depends on the client and where they're at in their journey. Um, but I found increasingly with a number of clients that you know they actually take the opportunity to almost reinvent themselves. Um, I can remember one client in particular, absolutely fabulous lady, and once, when she lost her hair through chemo, she was kind of not really sure what she was going to do with it afterwards, but actually it came back <clears throat> almost quite different, and that's quite common to how it had been before. And um, so she ended up keeping it as short and spiky and dyed it purple. So that became her kind of signature thing that she was now the purple lady, the lady with the purple hair. And it just gave her that, again, boost of confidence, that, you know, chutzpah to get out there and to start living. And, um, you know, she loved it. But for other ladies, it might be just the confidence, knowing what sort of underwear, what sort of clothes um, will will flatter them, and um, just you know, again, feeling confident when they get out and get dressed in the morning. I love the story about like stepping right back into the world and making this yeah. wonderful statement. That's glorious, isn't it? Brilliant. So, yeah. any tips for people who are currently going through treatment at the moment? Okay. Um, well, I think if you're going through treatment, it's about it's about comfort um, because you want to almost cosset yourself. So find some clothes that feel comfortable against your skin. Look for something that's maybe soft and fluffy, maybe not wool because that could be irritating and be itchy, but something that's soft and fluffy or silk or something that just feels gorgeous against your skin. And that should be for everyone, but definitely when you're going through treatment. Um, and also, you know, use colour. So you might not feel like putting a whole face of makeup on, but maybe a little bit of lip gloss and a, a scarf, whether you wrap it around your neck or you put it on your head. But if it's in a colour that really enhances you and makes you feel good, then, you know, that's what it's all about, is just putting, you know, f making you feel great when you leave the, you know, the house. Wonderful, wonderful. And it's lovely, the idea that about is, is these small little interventions that can make such a big difference. Yeah, it's tiny, it's tiny, and it can, it just shifts how we feel about ourselves and just makes such a difference. Fabulous. Gail's auction night, I must tell you about this, it sounds so good. She's given us a place on her Gail's Wardrobe That Works program. This normally goes up to 129 quid, but you need to bid for it, folks, and you need to bid, bid deep. Um, it's an eight-step program, and so you get help to create the wardrobe that enhances and flatters you and your body. So bid now in the chat room, use the word Gail, and um, Gail, that's absolutely wonderful, and thank you so much for being with us, really great. Thanks, Christopher. Now, um, next up on my list is Alexandra, but I don't know whether she's managed to make it into the room, has she? Annabelle, can you help me? Is Alexandra here? Uh, somebody tell me. I'm not seeing Alexandra at the moment. Can any so? Christoph, I can you? Uh, I I can see on Facebook she can't get in because the room's full. So maybe if Gail can get out now, she'll be able to come in. Fine. Okay. So well, maybe I, if you, I don't know if you want to move on to someone else, and I'll send her a message that she can log in in a minute. Uh, that'd yeah. be great. Um, Rachel's gone, so we should have one space for her. 
Um, but would the people who have already spoke of me join us as delegates? That would be really great. Fine. Shall we go straight on then and um, speak to Kerry Madgwick now? How about Absolutely. That? Kerry, yeah. um, just a quick intro. Kerry um, works with people uh, and to provide natural health solutions, a, a range of issues, but what she's going to be talking to us about today is about pH balance. Um, I did chemistry when I was uh, at uni, so um, pH is um, something I understand about being acid and alkaline, but I haven't really thought about the pH of my body, although I'm aware I've got an acid stomach, but <laughs> after that I think my, my knowledge goes to, uh, goes to pieces. So, Kerry, you're talking about pH balance yes. um, in, in, in the body, presumably. So what is this and, and why is it important? What does it do? Okay, so without taking you back to your science lessons at school <laughs> <laughs> and boring you, because I found that pretty terrifying myself, but and basically pH stands for potential of hydrogen. And all it basically, on a very basic level, it's just the acid and alkalinity in your body. So you are right, you have stomach acid, and yes, that should be acid. But most of the other tissues in our body should be alkaline. And um, if you think about swimming pools or soil, it's something that we always measure. The health of the soil or how clean your swimming pool depends on your pH. And the same thing happens in our body. So if our cells um, start to get too acid, then what happens is that allows the potential for um, bacteria and viruses and disease to thrive. So what we're trying to do is keep a kind of neutral level. Obviously our blood and our stomach are different. I'm talking about cells, not specific you know, stomach acid or blood. I'm talking about testing your urine and your saliva to give you a good indication of the pH levels in your body. That's interesting. So it's about actually setting the right environment for our bodies to to be healthy then? Yes, so, that's right. So we, we, we talk a lot about um, balancing the body and, and achieving optimal health rather than fighting disease because in a lot of instances what you keep fighting is what keeps happening. So, you know, it's kind of like we're, we're fighting not a losing battle as such, but if we focus on building up our health and balancing our bodies, then I think we have a bit, much better chance of um, reaching health or preventing cancer if we're in that situation. So rather than keep on sort of falling back into the trap, yes. actually lift ourselves right out of it. That's right, yeah. So, so how can you tell what your pH is? And I mean, obviously, if you if you checked your stomach, I mean, you'd, you'd get some rather rather scary reading, I suppose. Yes, yeah. So, um, the way I the way we always recommend doing it is um, with pH testing strips. Um, there is a link um, in the offer in in my free download to get the testing strips that I use. They're not the ones that you obviously have to buy, but always ensure that the testing slip is sorry, strips that you get off for saliva and urine because obviously you're not going to get a very accurate reading if you don't test those. And then all you need to do is for the saliva, you actually need to spit into a cup. Don't stick the strips into your mouth because you won't get a very accurate reading. And for the urine, you obviously either need to pee in a cup or pee on the stick depending on which you feel more comfortable doing. It is, so it's pretty simple then, in fact, to, to tell what your pH is. Yeah, it's a, and that's what I really like about it. It's a very, very easy method, and it's very easy for you to do at home. And it's something that, you know, the, the pH test strips come in boxes of 100. They're not very expensive at all. And it's a way that you can measure, you know, how your own body is reacting. So I, I really like it. I use it with all of my clients, and I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fantastic tool in amongst, you know, a lot of tools that we use to to measure our health. So, so uh, um, okay, so I, um, I get my reading, and, and it doesn't feel right. What can I do to change things for the better, then? Okay, so there are a number of things that um, affect the alkalinity of our body. Obviously, um, our diet and nutrition is, is one of those things, but it's not that complicated. So there are things um, that are a bit confusing for some people. So for instance, lemon, although it's acid, it forms an alkaline residue in the body. So lemons are really alkalizing, and the one thing we always recommend is drinking um, half a lemon in warm water every morning. It's one of the best things that you can do for your overall health as well as for the alkalinity of your body. 
the other thing is breathing, deep breathing. Unfortunately, um, not a lot of people breathe. As we get older, we tend to shallow breathe. And when you ask people to breathe, a lot of them breathe in and their shoulders go up when it should be your diaphragm that's moving in and out to ensure that the breath is going down into your diaphragm. And oxygen is will affect the pH. It will make your body really alkaline. So deep breathing is really essential. Poor digestion is another factor. So anyone who has any kind of digestive issues, it's something that you do need to work on um, to improve the alkalinity because poor digestion will put stress on your system and the stress can uh, create an acidic environment. So those are just a couple of you know really simple ways that you can improve the pH once you've tested it and if you feel that you're more acid than you would like, those are some really easy simple steps to improve the alkalinity. Interesting, so once you improve your alkalinity then you're, well you're improving your whole body health aren't you? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Really interesting. Kerry, thank you so much. Kerry's auction item is a one-hour consultation on Skype. So do bid for this and if you're successful you're going to get an hour with a skillful healer. Uh, a proven formula that's going to give you more energy and you'll get to feel great. Now, normally it would cost £125, but so to get your consultation with Kerry, um, bid high and uh, bid with the word Kerry. Kerry, thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd just like to, um, you know, a, 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 take, a quick takeaway that you think we should, uh, we should have? Um, no, just to say, I, I mean, my main thing is just to say thank you to um, you and Annabelle for organizing this. It's been fantastic. And I think, you know, everybody should, you know, who's logging in will really enjoy all the speakers. I think it's been absolutely fantastic. So enjoy the day and take away all the information. And as Christopher says, dig deep and, you know, let's just really raise lots of money for Macmillan because they do a fantastic job. Thanks so much, Kerry. Really great to have you on board. Um, Annabelle, how are we doing in the chat room at the moment? Okay, we've got lots of people talking to us saying thank you very much. Rachel's come back as the delegate, so uh, Rachel can still chat to you if you want to carry on talking to her about Zestember. Um, Helen Kennedy, piece of housekeeping, you're in twice, which is what caused the uh, lack of access to the speakers. I don't know how you managed it, but could you log out once without leaving us? We can tell this from the admin room. For the people with the pop-ins, if you click the bid now in the chat room and use the word Kerry, for Kerry's offer, it will open a tab that will take you to all the offers. So we've got Rachel's offer live in the chat room, Kerry's offer and Gail's. So it would be really great if you would click that orange bar and then I can remove the offer and we can see what's happening in the chat room. And I'll get back to you at the next round and let you know how we're doing. Fantastic. Well, and thank you, Rachel, for um, for making space because now we've got um, Alexandra in the room. Uh, Alexandra Meshu was an international level competitor in karate when she was younger. Um, she was representing Romania, and um, I'm just it's just a complete knockout to have an international athlete on board. Um, Alexandra's special subject uh, nowadays is how to use your body to reduce the aches and pains that come from holding a lot of physical tension and stress. I, I know I store my stress in my shoulders. <laughs> but the benefit of, of this is you relax the mind. If you get the body right as well, you relax the mind and then you can get more focused and more clear. And Alexandra's process looks at posture, um, at neck tension, that's a tick for me, please Alexandra, <laughs> shoulder tension, and walking soft and fluid movement. Um, so, Alexandra, do tell us, where does your interest in stress, and is both in mechanical and psychological, um, come from? Thank you for introducing me. Uh, it was a great introduction. Um, I do have to add that um, three weeks from now, I'm actually going to represent England in the World Championships. Oh, so fantastic! <laughs> <laughs> so, right, uh, where the interest came from? Well, I started practicing karate when, in 1995 when I was uh, eight years old. And then about four years later, um, I was part of the national team. Um, so at around 12 years old, I couldn't walk because of so much my knee pain, um, which later on now I know was caused by body misuse. So 
this turned out to be a great three meniscus damage on both knees, really bad damage. And after th therapies, I got better. In 2007, I took up running. And it didn't get better or worse. So a lot of people say running, yes, it, it creates damage. But it's not only the running that can create damage. In my case, it wasn't running. It didn't make any difference either way. And in 2012, I actually began getting fit through natural movement. So I was coached myself. And I was training for obstacle racing. So I wasn't training to, to, to fix my body. I was just training for more sports and obstacle racing. So knees and ankles, because I had problems with the ankles in the past as well, but knees more, have been an, a bit of an obsession for me because of all that pain. And, um, and when I saw that I started being pain-free, um, I, I began exploring movement and understanding about the mechanical and psychological stress and how they influence each other so we can protect our bodies more. Because mind and body are connected, so release tension in your body, release tension in your mind, and the other way around. And I also looked back and analyzed what happened, what movements uh, I did that weren't really good for the body and which led to such an injury. So I began understanding movement and efficient body movement. So today I, I work with uh, entrepreneurial and corporate women in particular uh, to get them uh, fully functional, as I say, uh, by reducing physical and psychological stress and also get them fit and healthy through a system I created called the Marie Shuri Technique. And uh, I, which I take my clients through. So yeah, this is where the interest com comes from, from a lot of injuries. <laughs> a, a really interesting, Alexandra, this idea of, if you like, the, you know, the body, and then it helps the way we think, and if you like, the whole, all this wonderful machinery functions better when, when you get down to a walking ride. Um, Alexandra, is the is the one sort of key tip that you can leave us with something that we yeah we really ought to do or look out for? Oh, there are so many things. So I had to pick <laughs> one. Uh, you mentioned posture. You mentioned posture, which is the most important thing. Everything starts with a good posture. If your posture is not right, your movement is not right either. But to be able to 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 be able to maintain a good posture. The one thing I want to leave uh, our listeners with today that will make a huge difference in all areas of your life, actually, if you apply it. To reduce stress, mechanical or mental, you must first become aware of yourself, aware of uh, the source of your stress, and aware of your body. Right? So the stop is something that I learned from my own coach. And what is the stop? The stop is about re uh, responding rather than reacting, as we do many times. So think about um, emotional lifting, about impulse buying, right? Everything just reaction. So, this is this is what I'm going to leave you with. Anything you do, stop for a fraction of a second before you do it. You acknowledge the moment, you become aware of what you're doing. Is your posture correct? Are you sitting, standing, walking? Are your shoulders relaxed? And then you do what you're about to do. So you continue your action. Now there are a few exceptions, such as driving, where you kind of have to <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so Not a good idea. Here. But uh, yes, it's a fraction of a second. Become aware of your body, of how it is positioned. Become aware of your thoughts, the source of your stress. And the fraction of a second can literally turn your life around if you do it. Really interesting, Alexandra. This is like the, the teaching of the mindfulness teachers about being aware. And yeah. um, I've heard the same thing in, in uh, Buddhism as well about respond, not react, take that moment. It's, that, it's not even a whole breath, but just that awareness moment of yeah. what's going on. It's a fraction of a second, that's it. Fantastic. Alexandra, thank you so much. Alexandra's auction item is a one-hour coaching call. I mean, we've had, what, I mean, three or four minutes with her. Imagine what a whole hour would be like. be brilliant. Um, so your hour coaching call with Alexandra would help to motivate you help you build some discipline, get your fitness back on track, but help you build awareness about how to do it in a way that's going to work for you and make you more upright and more in yourself. Alexandra's coaching is normally £100 for an hour, but for you, you can bid for it and, as I say, bid deep. But your auction code for Alexandra's uh, uh, coaching call is... Alexandra.
it's <laughs> Alexandra, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to have you on. Thing. And um, I, I, I didn't know that you were representing England now, but I'm wearing good hands. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. It's great being here. Uh, it's been great. So um, we've got quite a few auction items um, up in the room now. Um, it, there's a, a Rachel, Zesty Rachel Skype consultation. Um, there's Gail's uh, Women Wardrobe at the Works program. Um, Alexandra's uh, coaching call on fitness and health. And uh, Kerry's call on um, a consultation on uh, getting your... Uh, your chemistry right. Um, let's move on now to Alex Freeman. Um, Alex is a nurse specialist and she works with individuals and their employers and she helps people who've had an injury or an illness to stay in work. Um, Alex has been doing this for 20 years, doesn't look like it, it wouldn't be true, but uh, um, and her special interest is working with people, working with people who've got cancer. Um, but it, Alex has got such a deep experience, it's absolutely wonderful to have her on the call. Um, Alex, so, um, okay, I'm a boss and an employee tells me they've been diagnosed with cancer. And being both a boss and a chap, of course, I go into meltdown and I, I just want to run for the hills. But how is it going to affect the person themselves at work? I think, hello, first of all, good morning, everyone. But first of all, I think it's really important to um, remember that cancer covers a whole range of illnesses. So everybody experiences cancer very differently. Um, some will sail through with little signs or symptoms you probably wouldn't know that they were unwell. Some will have significant physical symptoms perhaps um, from the condition or the treatment they're having. Some will have significant psychological problems as a response to what they're going through. Some will have a combination of both. So I think the answer to that, and I'm probably not going to be very helpful, is that you probably won't know how it affects the person at work, but the key message is therefore, don't assume you know, um, but talk to them. Oh, scary stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, there's no way out, is there? You've just got to speak to people. But w what sort of approach can I take? Because I'm, I'm starting this and thinking, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm so frightened I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm just going to start blowing it all you know, six ways out of seven. Absolutely. And it can be really daunting for everybody. So, you know, one can walk on eggshells and, um, but. And it, it, just remember, it's hard for everybody to talk about. Everybody's got previous experiences that might define how they feel about that. Um, and you also don't know what's going on in, you know, you might have something going on in your background, so be, you know, be quite uh, sort of worried about it. But the things to consider, I think, are, first of all, uh, you know, don't expect your employee to tell you everything. They may want to keep certain things private so you don't you, you know you don't have to expect them to tell you everything just, just follow their cue also just be aware that um, you know the person might be feeling quite embarrassed you know about the um, physical effects of their disease so again you know don't expect them to tell you absolutely everything um, that they're going through and finally think about cultural differences um, for some uh, communities, talking about cancer is completely taboo. They might use a different terminology for it. Um, and in fact, some languages don't even have the word for cancer. So what I, my sort of key points when, when sitting down to talk with an employee who's told you they've got cancer is talk in a private area. So don't just go and sit on their desk in an open plan office and expect them to have a chat with you. Give them time. So not five minutes before you go off to a meeting. You know, you've got to give them as much time as they need. Um, watch out for cues, so be aware of their body language. If they're closing up, they may want to sort of stop that conversation now and perhaps pick it up again later. Um, be empathetic. You probably don't know what they're going through, um, but to be empathetic and just listen to what they're saying and, and react appropriately. One of the key things is, and we, we often use humour as a sort of coping strategy, but unless that person makes a joke of the situation, some people do use humour to manage cancer going through treatment 
unless they make a joke, don't make a joke, um, even if you feel more comfortable doing that. And finally, don't let the person get too distressed. So if you feel that they're getting distressed, pick up that conversation later. But I think the key message from that is um, they should go away from that conversation knowing that you're there for them um, so that they can come to you in the future should they need to pick up anything else with you. Alex, is really interesting and helpful. Um, can you give us some tips about the sort of support strategies I could put in place? What resources can I get hold of? How do I manage the impact on the rest of the team? I mean, there's, there's a lot you've got to think about, isn't there, when you've got yeah, this uh, absolutely. And, and again, everybody is different. So devise a plan of action with the person. Um, you can use other people as well. So you could use their own doctor. You could use an occupational health nurse. You could use someone like myself who does rehabilitation. Um, but think about adjusting duties, accommodating them according to their uh, treatment and symptoms, and be prepared to alter things as uh, you know how you're supporting them as time goes on because they may react differently to treatment. But So it's all about working collaboratively. Um, there's a fantastic resource available. I'm going to hold it up and hopefully you see if you can get this on the Macmillan website, um, macmillan.org.uk. It's the um, Essential Work and Cancer Toolkit. Um, and it's got really practical information for um, an employer, for their employees, um, and, and for colleagues as well. So it's got everything down from benefits to how to talk to people. So it's a really good resource, and I'd, I'd recommend every company to have one. And um, you also asked about colleagues. So, you know, colleagues may be upset and distressed if they've been told that, you know, their workmate, their friend has got cancer. So, and also they may have to um, be going through similar with a relative at home. You possibly don't know what they're going through and what sort of emotions that will bring up. So again, be mindful that people don't have the right to know everything that somebody's going through. But again, work with the employee to find out what they're happy with their colleagues knowing and plan the communication beforehand. So, you know, give a succinct message, but allow time for people to digest and talk it through don't allow it to turn into a gossip session. Alex, that's so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Alex's auction is just, um, this is um, fabulous, six 30-minute sessions with Alex, um, working well with cancer, Skype or telephone calls. I mean, Alex has got 20 years' experience of this in disability medicine, vocational rehab, absence management support. So, and six calls like this would normally be 600 quid. It's fantastic. Thank you so much, Alex. So, if there are any, uh, um, if there, if there are any companies out here on, on, on our call today, this is fantastic for anybody there. Bid with the word Alex. And, and Christopher, I'm getting uh, questions in the chat room about how to bid. So, um, for those of you who just it, yeah. joined us, if you want to see what all the offers are, you can click on the yellow bar on the offer that's live now in the room. You, it won't commit you to buying anything, but it will take you to Alex's offer and everybody else's. If you scroll down the page that opens, each offer has a word like Alex or Gail or Rachel. Pick up the offers you want to bid on and then go back to the chat room and put in an offer, for example, £20 Alex or £30 Gail. And I will pick up through the chat room where we are and uh, feedback on how the auction is going. So you won't be able to go into the chat room again till we turn the offer off, so we're alternating them. I'd also like to say that we have so far raised £396 from Macmillan. If you don't want to bid on the auctions but simply make a donation, the link is at the top of the chat room when we go back there. And thank you very much to everyone who's been donating live in the room. Every penny counts for Macmillan. Wonderful. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, and uh, just a, a quick clarification there. You don't, the, the only thing you have to put in the chat room is the name of the, uh, of the person whose offer you're bidding on and the amount. You don't just have to bring anything back from the, from the other page. Um, Annabelle, um, actually, you're next up um, to speak. Um, and Annabelle Kay is a specialist in the legal situation of people at work. Um, she's done employment law for over 35 years now, and um, 
she does what she calls the dark side of HR. Um, so, Annabelle, can you tell us something about the legal side of cancer at work? You would imagine, wouldn't you, that the law would be the last thing anyone with cancer should be thinking about. But sadly, a number of organisations respond quite badly to employees being sick. So the first thing anyone who's diagnosed with cancer needs to know is that from the moment of diagnosis, even if you still continue to feel fit as a fiddle, and many people do, you are covered by the Equality Act and you have the benefits of the protection that disabled people get. You don't have to be feeling ill or displaying any symptoms. Cancer is unique in that you are protected from the moment someone uses that word to describe your condition. That means that even if you're a short server, you are protected from being discriminated against because you've got cancer. Now sadly, some people are. I've been speaking to people in the last couple of weeks whose bosses have demoted them to less well-paid jobs because they needed a lot of time off sick. You need to be aware of your equality rights. We had a great download for um, handling sickness at work and everyone that signed in had access to it for free. You can also talk to Macmillan about that. The next problem that sadly some people at work get is that they get bullied. It's hard to imagine that when someone is coping with a cancer diagnosis, their workmates or their boss would decide to bully them. But sadly, in a tiny percentage of cases, this is the case. Bullying can take the form of being excluded from things as well as being treated badly. I've no explanation why this might happen, but if this is happening to you, you need to get on top of it quickly. The last thing you need to be doing is struggling through treatment and being bullied at work. Your HR department should be a source of help to you in this, and the first thing you need to do is to find out your equality and disability policy at work, your uh, bullying and harassment policy, and how, if necessary, to raise a grievance. But before you go the whole hog and get into legals and grievances, you might be aware that some people are simply rubbish at other people's problems and pain. That doesn't mean they hate you. That doesn't mean that they have actually set out to victimise you. It means that, frankly, they're pretty poor human beings and they are incapable of responding appropriately to your needs. So before you fight every battle, every step of the way, take a step back and ask yourself, is this making a difference? If it is making a difference and you're not being given the adjustments you need to go away and have your treatment or recuperate, and that might include homeworking, hours adjustments, extra sick leave, perhaps a swap round of duties. If it's not in that area and the people just aren't being as supportive as you might, I don't want to be the bearer of bad tidings, but we live in difficult times and it is extraordinary how insensitive some people can be. Before you rush off to the grievance department, I strongly recommend that you surround yourself with people who can support you, with people at work who are willing to support you and see how far you can get before you add grievance processes and even litigation to what sometimes can be a very difficult journey. But know there are lots and lots of people from ACAS, the Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service, to Macmillan and even us who do a certain amount of free support for people who are being bullied or not well treated at work, who are out there to help you. Don't suffer in silence. It may be that we can't fix everything for you, and nor can anyone else, but sometimes just having a chat to someone about what your problems are, the Macmillan line are wonderful for this, can help you pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and get moving. So those would be my really, really big tips. The law is a tool. <coughs> it's available to you, but before you start going legal, go personal, because sometimes that solves the problem. And be aware of the fact that your unsympathetic teammates and bosses are probably thinking, hard as it is to imagine, I've got problems of my own. 
And although your problems may be very big problems, to them, their problems are the biggest ones in town. We don't live in a perfect world. Christopher, was that too depressing for you? No, no, I mean, it's, it's just such wise advice, Hannibal, and thank you so much. And and, and the, the warning about, you know, be careful about going to law, um, having been in the law for 40 years, I would say, yeah, that's really good advice. Sometimes you've got to, and if you really have to, okay, but if you can avoid it, that's wise. Annabelle's auction item is an hour of advice on legal and HR matters. So whether you're an employer or an employee, this is a fantastic offer and it normally be over £400. But bid in the chat room with the word Annabelle and you get an hour with Annabelle or possibly me because we are <laughs> co-directors co and lawyers. But so you've got, a, you've got a legal team on your side if you want for an hour. Annabelle, thank you so much. Any quick, quick word before you go, or should I just keep cracking on? What I was thinking was, I'm always there to conciliate and solve problems, but my superpower, if you like, my special skill in this life, and I think you'd agree, is I do know how to bring it like it's never been wrong. So I kind of am a good red button for those that really need it, but don't go there lightly. <laughs> <laughs> I second that. I second that one. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Our next speaker is Karen Kennedy. Uh, Karen, are you, yes, you are, you are on. Oh, Hello. That's great. Karen, Karen Kennedy has many hats, uh, but today I want to focus on the fact that Karen's an inspirational women's coach and a confidant, um, and she addresses issues like lack of confidence and loneliness and disconnection. She works globally. You're speaking to us from Qatar, I understand, today. Uh, yeah. I, am. In, I mean. Uh, I just really, I, I love it the way the uh, the technology works. That uh, you know, you could be in the room next door. I uh, know. <laughs> fantastic, two, three, uh, two thousand miles away. Yeah. So, Karen, you describe yourself as a confidant. I mean, that's an interesting word to use. What's what's that about? Yes, I use the word confidant because um, I've always been described as a, a good listener. And although people sometimes think they're listening, a lot of the time what people are actually doing is waiting to get their word in and waiting to get what they want to say in when they're technically listening to somebody else. Whereas I really love listening to what somebody is saying and also act quite intuitively um, so I can hear what's being said under the words. And it's very important a lot of the time to have somebody who is just slightly removed from friends and family, especially at a difficult time. Um, and the difficult time could be relationship issues. Um, in this context today, of course, be very much focusing on a major health issue. Um, because what happens when we spill our heart out to somebody very close, a friend or family, they don't always know how to react. They can be distraught themselves. Um, they also never quite forget. So, for example, if it's a relationship issue um, and you've explained how you feel and then things have changed, that caring question always crops up, you know, so how are you here? You know, in a very deep and caring tone with that very concerned look, whereas actually you've wanted to move on. Um, so that's really why I use the word confidant. And you know, in the context of somebody having cancer, very often if somebody's the carer, they they don't feel it's appropriate to talk about what they're going through and their pain because the person that they're looking after obviously is one that has cancer and they feel particularly that they just have to keep their issues bottled up. But it's equally important for the carer to get support. And that incidentally is something that Macmillan are absolutely brilliant at. Fantastic. So this question about loneliness and disconnection, why the focus on, on that particular day and what can we do to help alleviate those sort of things, uh, Karen? Loneliness and disconnection not being heard or we've lost touch with what's important to us, that we're away from 
people that care about us or we lose touch with the things that really matter. Family. Um, so a lot of the time I'm talking to expats, for example, and it's a big issue. But it also happens when someone that you love and care deeply about is seriously ill because you can't anymore have that free exchange of conversation in the same way because all of a sudden your balance in the relationship has changed and you have to be a supporter whereas maybe you've been supported in the past. The whole balance changes. But you can do things and it's very important to do things to nurture yourself and to make sure that you're tapping back into that love inside and supporting yourself with love, not just the person you care for. And it's little things very often. You can listen to music that you love, um, just take a little bit of time just to walk outside, maybe listen to audiobooks. Very often at these kinds of times, actually reading is too much like hard work, too tiring. So even a little, quick, simple thing, we all have to go to the toilet, we all have to go to the restroom um, at certain times. Take your iPhone with your earbuds and just sit and just listen to some music that is really sublime for you. And that will just give you that little moment of recharging. There are lots of other things, but you know, they're just a little, little quick ones. Fantastic tips, Karen. Have, have you had experience of Macmillan yourself personally? Yes, I have. When I was um, 18, my grandmother was dying and my mother was looking after her at home. And Macmillan were absolutely fantastic. Uh, my mother had a specialist nurse in. And so both from looking after my grandmother from a medicinal point of view and a caring point of view, but also looking after my mother emotionally, which was very tough. Um, it's those last few days or the last few weeks are a very challenging time. Um, and on a slightly humorous note, um, the Macmillan was very nervous that an 18 year old student was in a house that had morphine in it and so was really pushing for my mother to <laughs> keep it under lock and key. So uh, I wouldn't have touched it, but my mother and I have giggled about that. So, <laughs> yes, I have, and they're marvellous, absolutely marvellous. I, uh, I think anybody who's had experience of them has got, and there's always this wonderful fund of, of, of good stories as well as this glorious sense of the compassion and caring that they bring to the, to the Absolutely. To the Yes. Karen, thank you so much for joining us and from such a long way away, it's absolutely brilliant. Yes. Karen's auction is a 90 minute Sky coaching session, that's normally £250, but so if you can draw on Karen's expertise, how you want it, on lifestyle, on mindset, on nutrition, um, she's got a, a, lot, of, a lot of hats. Um, and so you can you can pick the hat that you want and if you bid successfully for your 90 minute Skype session with Karen. So put your bid in the chat room and uh, with the word Karen and um, then you're uh, you're on the road there. Um, our next speaker is uh, V Roberts. Um, v, hello V. Hello. <laughs> V is from Inspire Your Biz and Insight to Marketing. Uh, she's a marketing. Oh, you are Insight to Marketing today. I see you've got your your banner up. Um, a marketing and communication specialist, and um, she's looking with us at workplace communication um, when people are ill. So, V, I mean, I've certainly seen with some of my clients when someone goes off sick for a long period the individual is sort of out of sight, out of mind, but that doesn't seem so smart. So tell us about internal communications and, and why this matters. Well, internal communications is very important within organisations of any size, basically because it does keep people informed about what's going on within an organisation. And that's not just staff, it's also key stakeholders, partners, and also anyone that wants to be aware of what's going on internally. Um, and it's very important because obviously it keeps people um, aware of what's going on, but also helps with employee retention as well. If people feel informed, they feel more empowered to do a good job. So what are the sort of methods that work to do this, Fee? 
Well, there are different methods. Um, traditionally, there's obviously things like team briefings and um, newsletters and online news. But more recently, people are taking advantage of things like social media, online forums, um, and things like video streaming and obviously uh, more outside of the box team away days and things like that. But so uh, still back to you've got you've actually got to speak to them. It's number one. Exactly. Yes. The traditional, oh, yeah, traditional some, speaking. Sometimes it's rather difficult. <laughs> so, what can a business do to keep employees engaged and informed when they're actually away? I mean, it's quite tricky, isn't it? Because if you're in the office, you you chit chat and so on. I mean, we you know we we do actually speak to people quite easily, but when when they're not there. Trickier. Yes, it does become trickier. I mean, it's it's also difficult in certain situations where there are sensitivities around access to members of staff, and also obviously finding out what people's preferences are. Um, if someone doesn't want to be contacted, then it's how you manage that. And I think advice initially would be to look at what the employee's preferences are and speak to them as well. It may be that they don't want to be contacted, you know, for the first few weeks or even months of uh, being in care, in, in care or treatment. Um, if that is the case, then the sensible approach is to actually speak to them at a time that's convenient for them and actually take note of what they would prefer in times of in terms of frequency of you know conversations or bulletins being sent if they want to have team meetings you know when do they want them um, how often do they want to be involved or invited and similarly if you're going to do things like newsletters you know how frequently should they be sent um, it's really about gauging what their preferences are and thinking outside of the box in terms of actually reaching them in a way that isn't going to harass them, if you like, at a time when they really don't want to be contacted. Well, it, it's interesting because some people feel like they're being harassed if you speak to them and other people feel like they're, they're being abandoned if you don't. So yeah. you, you've got to get it right for it yeah, to be legal, haven't you? Absolutely, there does have to be a balance, and obviously with key p bits of information, you know, if, if for example an employee needs to do a handover or anything like that, then that does need to be managed, you know, with um, HR support, um, and to ensure that people do feel like there has been a smooth handover or as smooth as possible, and that channels of communication are kept open um, in light of the situation. What about using social media? Because I mean, you, some things obviously you need to be private, not public. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, with social media, it's it's again. I, I wouldn't always advise that, and and certainly not to have someone you know linked to your Facebook page and your Twitter. But in certain circumstances, individuals might consider having private Twitter accounts or private Facebook accounts, or even private groups where they can actually speak with their team. Um, you know, and there are other options you know that you can use as well online for people to actually speak together without it being a public affair so to speak so although it is on the social media platform uh, such as things like Google Plus which we're using today or even um, you know um, Twitter and, and other methods they can speak offline so although it's on, a, on an online forum it can be taken privately into a sort of room if you like where they can speak with individuals or with their manager one-on-one -on -one. Interesting, really helpful, Lee, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's wonderful. I, I love the insight um, word because it's not only insight to marketing, but it's an insight to communication with your people as well, which is so important. V's auction item is terrific. It's a 30 minute consultation with her on employee communications and tactics, it's normally £45, and she's giving a mug away with that as well. Is that the mug? It is, yes. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So you can have your own coffee and new cup as well as having a chance to chat to V. Um, so bid for your consultation with V on communications and the mug. Um, and if anyone does want any more tips, just to say, Chris, we can actually offer that um, via a, a blog post, which I'll be putting up later on today around internal comms. So that will be accessible via the website, which is insighttomarketing.com forward slash blog. Brilliant. So, and thank you very much for reminding us about that, V. And um, yeah, and the there are free resources uh, as well from some of our other speakers too that are coming through on the emails. Um, but can I um, interrupt you to say you. we have a bid in the auction room for Alexandra's auction item of fifty-seven pounds. So, if anyone wants to bid higher than that, please put in the chat room what your bid is. Um, you can use um, these offer link to go through to all the offers and I've also put in the chat room a link so you can see what they are. Sorry to interrupt you but while that option's in flow I thought you ought to know. 
No, it's really the way we've raised more than five hundred and seventy pounds last time I looked through donations, and uh, people are being very generous live in the call. Fantastic! That's oh, six hundred and one. We've gone through the six hundred. <laughs> How Mary, exciting! Mary, wonderful. Our next speaker is Mary Waring, and uh, Mary uh, specialises in independent financial advice to women, uh, particularly when going through divorce. Um, Mary, are you on the, on this thing? I've seen well, I, I'm here. Can you hear me? Brilliant, brilliant. I can I'm hear here. you perfectly. Well, for women, okay. there we go. Lovely. Um, Mary gives us wonderful down to earth advice. It's no jargon. Her aim is to help women manage their money to give them confident peace of mind. I, I love her strapline. <laughs> a woman is a, a man is not a financial plan. Yeah, a, a man is not a, this yeah. is so true. Speaking of the man, I, I have no financial <laughs> plan for anybody. Um, and I think lots of men aren't. Um, so, Mary, it sounds like a very specific niche. So how did you first get involved in this and, and why? Well, I felt that the financial services industry is terribly male dominated. So the typical advisor is male, middle-aged, grey hair, grey suit, now there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but that's not going to work for everyone. And I do a lot of work with ladies going through divorce, and for a lot of these ladies, the husband has looked after the finance, so they're just feeling overwhelmed. And they don't need different advice to men, but they do need a different approach. They need looking after. And that's what I felt was really missing from the financial services industry, a company that was there to say, we're here to look after ladies who are very bright, but maybe just feel uncomfortable about finance. I mean, there definitely was a gap in the market, wasn't mm, there? Totally. Yeah. Um, so what advice have you got for listeners about protecting their finances if they're diagnosed with cancer? And this is another huge life event. Absolutely. Um, um, if, if you are diagnosed with cancer, you've got enough on your mind trying to look after your health without having to worry about your finance. One thing I would suggest somebody did well in advance and do it anyway, um, if you're employed, find out how long your employer will cover your salary and how much they will pay you when you're off ill. Now you may end up with just the statutory sick pay and that's £88 a week. So dependent on what you're earning, £88 a week is not going to go far enough. But dependent on the company and your position in there, you may well get a lot more than that. So some people I know, if they're in a senior position in a blue chip company, will get paid six months at full pay and then six months at half pay. So if you are in that lucky position, it means that at least you don't have your finance to worry about. You're not worrying about, can I pay my mortgage? next month and, and therefore freeze yourself up um, put your energy into getting well instead. The um, six month full pay and six month half pay sick pay schemes are pretty rare though. I, mean, I suppose the thing is people need to know what's coming up. You need to know and of course anyone who has been in their company for a while may still have that old system less likely for newer companies now, but I do know a number of people who do have that level of payment. But but the fact is, find out in advance. Don't yeah. wait until you're ill and your money is very tight before you check that out. So for those who aren't employed, what can you do? I mean, if you've got your own business, I mean, suddenly everything's looking like meltdown at that point. Absolutely. Well, if you aren't employed and you've um, very low savings, you are eligible for welfare. But if you've got savings over 16,000, you're not eligible for anything. And dependent on what your partner's earning, if you've got a partner, you may not have eligibility. What I recommend everyone should do, and this would include someone who's employed, who won't get paid an awful lot if they're off sick, have an emergency fund of at least three months worth of your normal income. And in an ideal world, you want six months. So if you normally earn £2,000 a month, have a pot of somewhere between six and £12,000 
and that's your emergency fund if you're off ill. And of course the other problem if you're self-employed, once you go back to work, you can't necessarily pick your business up where you left it because some of your clients may have moved elsewhere. No, ma no matter how much they'd like to be loyal to you, if they need a service and you're not there to provide it, they may have gone elsewhere. So even once you're back working, you're still going to need that emergency fund to top up your income. Absolutely. Um, sage advice. Uh, mm. any, any other financial tips? Uh, the one thing I'd say for anyone who thinks, oh, I, I haven't got money to save, I'd suggest doing a detailed record of everything you spend. Do it over a period of, say, three months so that you can start to see a pattern and look at every item on that list and ask yourself, how can I reduce that figure? And a lot of people are surprised at how much they spend on coffee, maybe sandwiches, things like that. If you do want to save, potentially there are areas of saving there. You just need to be aware of what it is you're spending your money on first. Gosh, that's sage advice, isn't it? We should look, look at where it's going. We probably should do, the same. We should do the same with our time as well. Absolutely, because we? until you know where it's going, you can't do anything about controlling it. So that is the first step, yes. Yeah, yeah what we measure, we control. Yeah. yeah. Mary, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. So helpful and useful. And Mary's um, items in the auction, actually, Mary, we put two items into the auction. One is a copy of her book, The Wealthy Woman, A Man Is Not a Financial Planner. <laughs> uh, I, I just love that. It's normally uh, twelve ninety nine on Amazon. And a one-hour session on the telephone with Mary. Normally it's £250. But to look at where you are now, where you want to go, and the steps you can take to get from A to B, from where you are to where you want to be. Um, so sort of a, a clarity moment about your finances and a clarity moment about where you can go with them. Mm -hmm. So bid in the chat room with the word Mary for her book and a one-hour session to unravel your finances, get yourself on the road to somewhere with your own money. Mary, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful having you on the, on the session. And I just want to tell you we've got £626 <gasps> raised by donation. Fantastic. It's brilliant. And uh, because not everybody's come on this with their credit card yet. The credit cards are going to be... Uh, um, yeah. I still... I still have a £57 bid on Alexandra's offer in the auctions and we will be keeping the chat room open after we finish going live for people to catch up with that a bit. So um, fingers crossed we can raise some more money still. Brilliant. And finally our last speaker, last but by absolutely not least, <laughs> is Julie Dennis. And Julie specialises in weight loss and hormone balance for women over 50 and through the menopause. Um, Julie said, if you're serious about succeeding in the workplace, you need to be serious about your health. Um, this makes sense of sense to me. But you need the energy. If, you, if, you're, if you're not um, uh, healthy, then um, you, you're looking after that rather than um, getting on with being in business. Julie works with women in business and she shows them simple solutions about how to burn fat, how to beat stress, how to boost your energy. Um, do that and then you can ramp your productivity and get your performance and promotion um, going. Um, Julie, hello. Wonderful to have you on the call. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Christopher. How are you doing? Very well. Julie, has a healthy lifestyle always been you know, something high on your list? <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Um, despite the way I choose to live my life now, that hasn't always been the case. And uh, probably up until my mid-30s maybe, I didn't give much thought at all to what I ate, I smoked and I drank too much. And you know, by that stage I knew I wanted to change, but it's, you know, change is scary, right? Yeah. So instead of doing anything, I just thought about it for a couple of years. So essentially, on the outside, nothing changed. Um, eventually I quit smoking, but what I decided to do was to replace cigarettes with chocolate hobnobs. <laughs> so what happened was I put on rather a lot of weight. And 
you know, I really didn't want to give those chocolate hobnobs up. They'd become really important to me. So I started running as a way to get control of my weight. And as to, to a certain extent, that worked. I did lose weight. But what surprised me was that my body shape didn't change. I had this kind of pot belly. And in fact, when I crossed the finishing line of the London Marathon in 2009, my pot belly wobbled across a few milliseconds before the rest of me. <laughs> at, the, uh, at the time, I decided to put it down to genetics rather than hobnobs. But, uh, but what I know now, of course, is that there's, uh, there's much more to, to health and well-being than calories in, calories out. And that, you know, exhausting myself by running miles and miles to try and counterbalance a hobnob habit wasn't necessarily the, uh, the smartest way to stay healthy or lose weight. Julie, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're so looking forward to seeing you as well as hearing you. Could you turn your camera on? Um, it is on, so I'm not sure why I'm not what I'm not why I'm not being seen, Annabelle. Okay, I just thought I'd um, see. Yeah, we'll see now I can see it. Yeah. Fix it. Keep talking, my Th sweet. Thanks for mentioning it, Annabelle. Yeah. Um, so, Julie, if, if I'm a woman in business looking to burn fat, is to beat the stress, to get my productivity up, where do I start? Have we lost Julie altogether? Here we are. Good question. You know, where, where on earth do, do you start, Christopher? Because there's an array of confusing advice out there, right? You know, all promising, boundless energy, bikinis, bodies, eternal youth. You know, you've got low carb, you've got low fat, detoxing, meal replacements, juicing, superfoods. You've got running groups, gyms, personal trainers, boot camps. Um, it, it's overwhelming. Fortunately, my background is actually in data analysis and reporting. So what that means is that I'm actually really good at taking those vast amounts of complex information, consolidating it, and, and presenting it back in delicious bite-sized chunks. So where do you start? Uh, my view is that you begin with sound process, just like you do in business. Um, I like to call it an expert solution system, actually, and mine has, smart, has, uh, has seven smart steps. So... Step one, and this is before you even start looking at what you eat or the way in which you exercise, is you've got to set yourself some gorgeous goals and some, some really specific targets. You know, you need to get clear on exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve, just like you do in business. Um, when you're working in business, you have business plans, you have marketing strategies, you have cash flow forecasts. You know exactly where you want to be in six months' time and 12 months' time. And you, you need to manage your health in exactly the same way, you know. Think of yourself as a project. Get specific on the outcomes you want and then put the systems in place to ensure that you achieve them. You know, you wouldn't at work, you don't set up meetings without being clear on the timings, the agenda, the required output. So don't go food shopping without a list. And, uh, you know, don't make that list until you know what you're going to be eating that week. <laughs> Interesting. I'm, I have actually been in meetings when people obviously don't know what they're doing. So. Oh, I know. And you are, yeah, and you get absolutely nowhere, do you? Yeah, you know, absolutely. You waste you of everybody's really waste time. time. Julie, I know that one of your sort of special subjects, as it were, is about um, hormone imbalances. And what's the, what's the most common hormone imbalance that you see, and what sort of effect will that have? Um, the most common hormone imbalance I tend to see in my, in my clients um, is cortisol, actually, and that's the most common common hormone imbalance in women. And cortisol is your uh, it's your main stress hormone, and uh, that's not just about external stresses. You know, if you've fallen out with your teenager, or maybe you're feeling a bit grumpy with your boss, <laughs> it's about the internal stresses that go on inside your body too. And when your cortisol levels are high, when they're out of control, it can be like uh, like drinking a couple of cans of Red Bull or having a couple of shots. Of, uh, of espresso, you know, you get that sense of second wind or energy, you think you're acting really fast and coping with multiple things, but actually you're rushing from task to task and you're not finishing anything properly, you know, you're relying on sugar and caffeine to get you through the afternoon and then you can't sleep at night. But the, uh, the most interesting thing about cortisol and business performance is that when you're very stressed, the, uh, the creative part of your brain switches off and you go, into, uh, you go into survival mode. So you become reactive rather than proactive. You know, you're stuck acting in the moment rather than planning for the future. You can't think, think strategically for business when you're in survival mode. And, uh, and the other thing to, to know about cortisol is that when your body's stressed, it's going to deposit fat around your tummy. So uh, anyone out there who's uh, who's who's uh, uh, battling a bit of middle age spread, middle age uh, middle age spread, it's uh, it's quite likely that something going on with your stress hormones. Fantastic. Um, 
two years. Yeah, sorry. sorry. I was going to say, I'm just conscious that we're slightly running out of time, I'm afraid. But it's just fascinating. I can see you've got you've so much information and so much to help people with. Um, a, a, a quick sort of takeaway, and then I was, I'm really want to tell people about your auction. It's so uh, exciting. Um, well, I just wanted to to finish by saying uh, thank you to Annabelle um, for organising today, and that, that to everyone who's listening, you know, there's been a lot of information shared in, here here today by by a lot of experts, and uh, don't try to change too much at one thing. Just take one or two things from from the, from all of the speakers today, um, uh, because the secret to success is uh, it's small steps and it's consistency. Um, so good luck with everyone with all the changes that you'll be making. Fantastic, Julie. Thank you. So it's really wise. Otherwise, you just think, oh, no, there's so much to do. So I yeah, think I'll do we're nothing. not going to do back, it. Yeah, back, overwhelmed. Back to the <laughs> and if the 80 20 rule is 80% uh, food and 20% gin, it's not really going to work, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing wrong with a bit of gin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think 20% may be a little bit on the high side. <laughs> <laughs> Julie's, Julie's auction item found a 45 minute Skype consultation worth 250 quid. But so, so clear and helpful and useful advice about how to get yourself in a more energetic and effective frame of mind. Um, thank you so much, Julie. It's been wonderful having you on the call. Oh, thank uh, you, Christopher, and thank you for, for hosting today. Um, Annabelle, can we have a quick recap on the chat room? How, how are things going? Okay, um, the auctions are going slowly because people are being very sweet and donating is the answer to that. So we'll keep the auctions open after the event so that we can email them around what the highest bids are and give people a final opportunity to close out on those. Um, the actual donations in the event are at £646. Fabulous. So, um, assuming our auction bids are good, we will go higher than that, but that is very generous of everyone who joined us for a very, very good cause. Thank you so much. Well, we're coming to the end of our session now. I've had a great time and I've learned lots today, and I want to extend a huge virtual thanks to our speakers who gave the time, uh, they gave the uh, information that you can find on the links in the emails after the event. They give the auction items their times ready to be to be spent with you if you want it. That's absolutely great. And thank you everyone who's been on the call for joining us. And we hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And a um, special shout out to the people who are getting no glory, the backroom boys. There's Susan who's been organising the chat and at the back of this there's been Jeremy Kay, who got all our speakers to actually appear on camera in the first place. <laughs> you know, we've had nine blank speakers today, not just the one, had we not had his help. To Wendy Keir, who helped with the graphics, attempted to teach me how to organise a virtual event. I had no idea, now I have half an idea, that's progress. And Christopher to you, who never introduced yourself, to my lovely co-director, a barrister with heart, but most of all, to the Macmillan team for being there when we need them. Right. That was my final thank you with Tom Miller. Absolutely. Brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you very much everybody. And uh, and Jenny sitting next to you and well, there we go. Still got the teddy. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Goodbye everybody. <laughs>